Good evening, and welcome to Zoom into Nature Lichens. Oh, I want to start my camera for you all. There we go. <laughs> I'm Renee Baranca. Welcome to Zoom into Nature Lichens. I lost my spot by doing that. This evening, Ian Adams will be presenting his program, The World of Lichens. I'm Renee Baranca, the Director of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. At the Land Conservancy, I develop nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages, often utilizing the expansive network of conservation properties the Land Conservancy has protected in Northeast Ohio which totals over 70,000 acres of natural landscapes, family farms, and urban green spaces. I spend a lot of time outside, and I feel like I know a little bit about many nature topics, but when it comes to lichens, I really fall short. I honestly think the only lichens I can confidently identify are British soldiers. So I'm really excited for Ian's program this evening to learn more about these amazing organisms along with many of you. One piece of housekeeping during tonight's presentation, please put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please don't use the chat feature. We'll spend time at the end of Ian's program um, to answer questions. It's my pleasure to introduce Ian Adams. Ian is an environmental photographer, writer, and educator specializing in Ohio's natural, rural, historical, and garden areas. 23 books of his color photography have been published, and he has produced more than 65 Ohio calendars and conducted over 200 seminars and workshops in nature, garden, and digital photography throughout North America. For 10 years, he was an adjunct lecturer at The Ohio State University's Agricultural Technical Institute in Worcester, that's Ohio, where he taught horticultural photography. Ian lives in Cuyahoga Falls, and shares his home with a tuxedo cat named Spicer and a Maine Coon named Madeline, as well as a variety of cameras. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? Renee? Yes, we can hear you, for can sure. Can you see my screen? Yep, looks great. Okay. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking Renee uh, for the opportunity to share another program with you this evening. Last year at this time, Renee invited me to share a program called Fungus Among Us, the World of Mushrooms. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with mushrooms. Many of you may enjoy eating them um, like I sometimes do, but not very many people seem to be familiar with the world of lichens. Um, I've been studying them and getting to know them and taking lots of photographs of lichens now for about 10 years. And so this evening, my goal is to help you understand a little more about lichens, what they are, how they fit into the natural world, where to find them, how to help you identify them, and learn a little bit more um, than I'm going to be able to cover this evening. So um, we can begin. Let's go back about 300 years to the mid 1700s. Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern taxonomy, he's the fellow that worked out how to name all of the different aspects of nature. And he described lichens as nature's paupers. He assigned a single genus, lichen, to all species of lichens. And then he went ahead and described about 109 species. This was back in the mid 1700s. Let's jump back to today. Today, we know that there are hundreds of lichen genera. More than 16,000 different kinds of lichens have already been described including more than 6,000 species of lichens that grow in North America. Lichens cover six to eight percent of the land surface of the earth. If you've been outside today, you have seen lichens. You just may not have realized it. Many of the huge areas of tundra, for example, in Canada and in Russia, Siberia in particular, are covered with lichens. 
and we'll talk more about those later. Lichens may be the world's oldest living organisms. With some Arctic yellow-green map lichens, Rhizocarpum geographicum, for those of you that like Latin names, in northern Alaska's Brooks Range, some of those lichens have been estimated to be more than 4,500 years old. Let me introduce you to the yellow-green map lichen. Fortunately, we don't have to go, and I have never been, to the Brooks Range in northern Alaska. Let's go instead to a place that I have been to a couple of times, Mount Washington in New Hampshire. This is in northern New England, in the White Mountains, where many of the peaks are named after early United States presidents. And this photograph was taken about 500 feet below the summit of Mount Washington. Mount Washington is the tallest mountain in the Northeast United States. It's not the tallest mountain in the Eastern US. There are several mountains like Mount Mitchell and several peaks in the Smoky Mountains in the Southern Appalachians, which are a little bit taller than Mount Washington, but at 6,300 feet, it's certainly the tallest mountain in the Northeast United States. And fortunately, I didn't have to hike to get up to uh, the summit. I was able to drive up. There is a road, part dirt road and part blacktop road, which stretches for eight miles and climbs about 4,500 feet to the summit of Mount Washington. So what you're seeing is um, a shot that I took uh, in the morning uh, in June, about 10 years ago, uh, when I made the trip up to the top of Mount Washington, I was looking for alpine wildflowers. And the best time to see those is often in June. And we're looking down the mountain to a sea of cloud. And in the foreground is what is called Felsen Mere, which literally means a sea of rocks. So I was headed down to the Alpine Garden, and this was the trail. Yeah, it doesn't look like much of a trail, does it? Uh, the cairns, the piles of rock that you can see, are there because the summit of Mount Washington is frequently fog-covered and full of mist, and it's virtually impossible to find your way unless you have these cairns. The trail, well, it, it can best be described as a pile of rocks. I made it about a couple of hundred yards down the trail until I thought, you know, this is gonna be a little bit difficult. Um, and so I went back up to the parking area. And fortunately, as you'll see in the next slide, I found a couple of the wildflowers there. Before I leave this photograph, look at all the yellow blotches on the rocks, which is granite. Um, in this particular area. So these two photographs were taken from the parking lot about 500 feet below the summit observatory. There's a weather observatory that is manned every day of the year on the top of Mount Washington, which as we'll see, receives some pretty bad weather sometimes. These were a couple of the things that I came to see. On the left is a tiny dwarf azalea. Yep, it's in the same species or the same genus of plants, rhododendron, as, as the azalea that grows in your garden. But this one is only a few inches high. And on the right is pincushion plant, diapensia, which is another of the wildflowers that bloom in June. Very, very fleeting because most of the weather up at Mount Washington is much more severe than this. But take a look at the rock up here and in the left-hand side, the yellow-green blotches. This is where I would like to start by sharing some lichens with you. This was a photograph that I took while I was on the Alpine Garden Trail, and it's a close-up of a rock and what you're looking at are several species of lichens, and they are what are called crustose lichens. They look just like somebody has spray painted the rocks. The yellow-green map lichen is the 
um, the one with the yellow green speckles and little tiny black features, which are called apothecia, which are part of the reproductive apparatus of the lichen. Right next to the yellow map lichens are some orange crustose lichens. These are orange boulder lichens in the genus Porpidia. Um, and the orange color comes from the fact that there's iron in the rocks. And that's what causes that. The wonderful looking spider is an Arctic wolf spider. And um, much to my delight, these quite large, up to about a couple of inches long, these spiders were running all over the, uh, the rocks. The Arctic wolf spider, like all wolf spiders, does not spin a web. It chases down its prey. And these spiders were running all over the rocks. And I was lucky enough that one would sit there just for a couple of minutes while I was taking these photographs. So this is um, the Arctic wolf spider. And these are yellow map lichens. This is what Mount Washington looks like for about six months of the year. For about six months, maybe a little less now with climate change and a warming climate, but uh, it used to be about for eight months of the year, the summit of Mount Washington was covered with deep snow for six to eight months. The highest wind speed in the world 231 miles an hour was recorded on the summit of Mount Washington, and the low temperatures have been down as far as minus 95 degrees Fahrenheit. They had a record low of minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit up there in 2022. So what happens to all the wildflowers and what happens to the lichens? Well, basically the lichens shut down. They just go to sleep. All of their metabolic processes stop and they go into a state known as cryptobiosis. But amazingly, lichens can actually create food for themselves on sunny days, provided the sun is out, as far down as minus 20 degrees centigrade using photosynthesis, as we'll see in a moment. So lichens are pretty tough to be able to survive that kind of winter weather, buried in snow, uh, freezing cold temperatures, high winds for six months. How tough are they? Well, Scientists wanted to find out. So in 2013 to 2014, they made up some panels, which you can see in the local, local lower photograph with a beautiful lichen called the elegant sunburst lichen, Rosavskia elegans. And they sent this up to the International Space Station for one year, actually 14 months. So during this time, these lichens were outside in space, they, they were subject to solar ultraviolet radiation. They were hit by cosmic rays. There was a vacuum, no air. And the temperatures, when it was sunny, varied from 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it went into the shade, the space station was at minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which is similar to conditions on the surface of Mars. At the end of that time, they returned the lichens to Earth. And when they warmed up, they started living all over again. That's how tough lichens are. How tough are lichens? Some of you may remember the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster. Chernobyl is in northern Ukraine. Uh, in 1986, one of the major reactors exploded and it caused a tremendous number of problems. Uh, a number of people died from exposure to radiation. The area around the plant was covered with lichens and those lichens were able to tolerate a daily dose of 2000 rads of radiation for two years. At the end of those two years, the lichens were still going fine. One dose of 400 rads, just one dose is lethal for most human beings. Sadly, in Lapland, which is north 
of the uh, Chernobyl area. Uh, more than 70,000 reindeer, which were the mainstay of the Sami people in northern Lapland, had to be destroyed when they became radioactive from eating lichen, their primary winter food, which was contaminated from the radioactive Chernobyl fallout. So lichens are capable of surviving the most incredibly extreme climatic conditions, except for one thing which we'll talk about later in the program. But as Bill Bryson, a wonderful writer, uh, some of you may have read his, uh, um, his books, consider the lichen. Lichens are just about the hardiest visible organisms on earth, but the least ambitious. So let's begin by um, making sure that we understand what a lichen is. Is it an animal? No, it's not. Is it a plant? No, not really. A lichen is a combination of a fungus and either a very primitive plant called an alga or um, a type of bacteria called cyanobacteria, which used to be called blue-green alga. So how does all of that work? Well, to explain it, a lot of lichenologists like to tell the story of Fred Fungus and Alice Alga. So on the top left, you can see a picture of Fred Fungus before he became a lichen. He doesn't look like much, but Fred was a, a good architect. He was a wonderful civil engineer. He would built himself a very good, solid, secure home. But Fred Fungus had one problem. He was almost at the point of starvation because Fred Fungus couldn't cook. On the right, we can see Alice Alga, who was nearby. As you can see, an alga is a rather delicate looking thing. She was definitely in need of a home. She was in need of protection. But the one thing that Alice Alga knew how to do was to create food. Through the magic of photosynthesis, she was able to take carbon dioxide and water and sunlight together with the chlorophyll inside her and use those to create carbohydrates, sugar. So we all know that happened. Fred Fungus and Alice Alga met one day. They took an instant lichen to each other, and that is how lichen began. And so on the bottom, you can see a common green shield lichen, which is um, a lichen that most of you have seen, um, I'm sure, uh, on trees. Usually that's where it likes to grow. Um, and it is a combination of a fungus and an algae. Of course, like all relationships, um, the fungal algae relationship has its ups and downs. On good days, lichens will go out on a limb for each other, no pun intended. This is a photograph of a branch of a yew tree at Seacrest Arboretum in uh, Worcester, Ohio, uh, close to where I taught digital photography for 10 years for Ohio State University before COVID came along. And this branch is covered with at least a dozen different kinds of folios lichens. We'll see what those are in a little while. So this was on the good days. Of course, on the bad days, Fred Fungus and Alice Alga perhaps didn't get along too well. And some days they even thought that their marriage was on the rocks. But here's a photograph of rocks covered with lichens. This was taken in the summit of Mount Cadillac in Acadia National Park. Uh, Mount Cadillac is famous as the place where the sun first comes up in the lower 48 states in the United States. It's the first place to get the morning sunlight. And you can drive up to the top of Cadillac Mountain. And when you get there, if you look at the granite rocks, you will see they are completely covered with lichens. So even though they've had their ups and downs, 
In general, the relationship between Fred Fungus and Alice Alga has been working well because lichens have been around on planet Earth for about 300 million years. So there are three types of lichens and lichens typically like to grow in three different types of places. First, there are crustose lichens, and these are growing. This is the photograph I showed you taken on Mount Washington. Crustose lichens growing on rock. Think of crustose lichens as lichens that are very thin. They only have one upper surface. They are attached to the rock, very, very difficult to separate from the rock without a hammer and a chisel. Next to them is common green shield. Common green shield is a folios lichen. Folios means leaf-like. And in fact, folios lichens look rather like a leaf. They have a top surface and a lower surface, and you can actually lift them up and peel them away from whatever they are resting on, which in this case is tree bark. A lot of folios lichens like to grow on trees. On the right is the third type of lichen, fruticose. Fruticose are three-dimensional lichens. They come in different shapes and sizes, and they grow in different places too. Some of them look like beards. They look like strands of hair. This one is called Methuselah's beard. Some of them look like powder puffs or sponges, sort of like you might use in a bath, like this one powder puff lichen, which is growing on sandy soil. Some of them look like little tiny vegetables, cabbages, kale, lettuce, something like that, like this one, sinewed ramelina growing on tree bark. And this one, which uh, Renee mentioned, the, the, the lichen that many people um, may be familiar with these amazing little lichens that look like little shrubs, little green shrubs with red caps. These are the well-known British soldier lichens. So we have crust-like lichens, we have leaf-like lichens, we have beard-like lichens growing on rock or growing on tree bark or growing on soil. That's sort of an idea of the three different kinds of lichens and what they typically grow on. So here's a photograph that I took. Um, this was at the home of a gentleman called Ray Showman. Ray Showman worked as a professional lichenologist. His entire career was devoted to studying lichens in Ohio. And he worked for over 30 years for Associated Electric Power Company headquartered, I think, in Columbus. And this is a photograph of a section of the trunk of a dogwood tree in his garden. And there are crustose lichens here, these tiny little lichens here. This is called bumpy rim, a crustose lichen. Here we've got a folios lichen. This one is smooth axle bristle lichen. Another folios lichen that looks a little bit like a ruffle because it's erect above the surface of the, the bark. This is powdered ruffle lichen, another folios lichen. And here, sinewed ramelina, a fruticose lichen, all growing together on a section of a dogwood tree. Let's take a look at a folios lichen. Folios lichens are perhaps the most common lichens that most of us see. Um, and if you were to take a cross section of a folios lichen, and that cross section is only gonna be um, a millimeter or so in thickness. So in order to see what we're looking at here, you would need a microscope or a, a, at least a, a magnifying glass. But as you look at cross-section through the skin, if you will, the thallus, as it's called, of a folios lichen, it has a top surface, the, the top skin, if you like, that's called the upper cortex. Underneath that upper cortex is the algal layer, which is the 
part of the lichen that actually creates the food for the lichen. This is the algal layer that photosynthesizes. Underneath that, the thickest part of the skin, if you will, of the lichen consists of a lot of filaments. Hypha is the singular name, hyphae with an E. Um, and this general area is called the medulla. Folios lichens have a lower skin, the lower cortex. But the only way that they're attached to the substrate, they don't grow into it. They simply are attached by, if you will, little wires, one or more little wires, which are called rhizines. So a little more technical stuff before we look at some more photographs. So how do lichens reproduce themselves? How do lichens create other lichens? They do it in three ways. They do it sexually by ejecting spores, just like a fern or a moss or other bryophytes. Um, the spores combine sexually within a receptacle, which in a lichen is often called an apothecium. And you can see photographs of apothecia on the surface of a folios lichen in the photograph below. So the spores get ejected from the apothecium. The spores are already fertilized, but they have to find a substrate where they can germinate and they have to find a substrate where they can meet Alice alga or another type of alga that they're compatible with, otherwise they will die. The other way that lichens reproduce is via fragmentation. And fragmentation is when a little piece of the lichen complete with the fungal part and the algal part uh, breaks off and can travel to other places and create new lichens. And that happens in two ways. Sometimes the surface of the lichen breaks up into little tiny balls of fungal hyphae surrounding alga. And that is called ceridia. And there's a photograph of it underneath here. If you brush your hand over this, you'll see little tiny granules will appear. And those are the ceridia, which are little tiny pieces of lichen that are ready to grow into other lichens. Or sometimes the upper cortex actually develops these projections which can break off and inside the projection again is a combination of the lichen hyphae and the alga. And again, these little projections called isidia, and you can see a picture of those below, they will break off, maybe carried on a bird's foot or on the feet of a rodent or in a drop of water or via wind currents. And that can also create new lichens. So here's a photograph of apothecia. One of the ways that to help to determine what kind of lichen you're looking at is the shape and the size and the color of apothecia, if in fact that species of lichen produces apothecia. Bumpy rim lichen. British soldier, the apothecia are the red caps on the end of the stalks, the pedicia. This one is called star rosette lichen, and it tends to grow on branches. Often the branches at the very top of the tree will get the lichens first, and then they will gradually work their way down the tree. Down on the left is another type. This is bushy beard lichen, and these large light green um, structures are the, the apothecia, the reproductive spore producing part of the lichen. And this bright colored uh, light orange yellow lichen is maritime sunburst lichen, and you can see it produces orange apothecia. We'll revisit that a little bit later on. So this is a very common lichen. 
Uh, it tends to grow mostly on the trunks and branches of trees. Very common in Ohio. You can find common green shield in every county of the Buckeye State. It may well be growing on a tree in your garden. Notice that the center part, this whole area is called the thallus. These are the lobes of the thallus. And in the center of this roughly circular thallus are all of the granules of the ceridia. So it doesn't have any apothecia typically, but it does have the ceridia. And when these fragment, that's how common green shield reproduces. On the right is a powdered ruffle lichen. You can see that the lobes are somewhat similar shape and almost not that far off in color to the common green shield, but they tend to stand up from the surface of the bark rather than lay flat like the common green shield. And if you look closely, you can see that the ceridia are not in a big mound in the center. They are growing along the margins of the lobes of the ruffle lichen. So the position of the ceridia is very important when you're trying to identify what kind of lichen it is. Isidia tend to be tiny. I had to use a macro lens to take a close-up photograph of this common antler lichen, which I photographed in West Virginia, and you can just see these tiny, tiny little acidia, but you would need a magnifying glass to see them. They're that small, but they perform the same purpose. They help the lichen to reproduce. Let's look at a few crustose lichens. The black rock was sharp edged hot and hard as corundum. It seemed not merely alien, but impervious to life. Yet on the southern face of almost every rock, the lichens grew yellow, rusty brown, yellow green, like patches of dirty paint daubed on the stone. It's a quote from one of Edward Abbey's novels. He's one of my favorite nature writers of all time. He wrote a wonderful novel called The Brave Cowboy, made into a great film with Kirk Douglas called Lonely Are the Brave. And I took this photograph of many different species of crustose lichens on a rock in southwest Utah. But I didn't have to go that far. I took this photograph right outside my front door of my little Cape home in Cuyahoga Falls in Northeast Ohio. And this is the concrete. Now, if I was a proud homeowner, I would probably be told to pressure wash the concrete to get rid of these brown and yellow stains. But these brown and yellow stains are lichens. And because I'm fond of lichens, I let them live there on their own. They're really not doing any harm. Let's take a close up of this part of the concrete on my front patio. Here's a close up of sidewalk fire dot lichen. Xanthocarpia feticissima, for those of you that um, love to have the Latin names. The sidewalk fire dot lichen is found, as its name suggests, on sidewalks. And you can go out on just about any sidewalk, anywhere. And if you look down very carefully, get down on the ground with a magnifying glass, you'll probably find a few of these sidewalk fire dot lichens growing. This was taken at the Holden Arboretum, a boulder in the gardens there. And this is concentric boulder lichen. Porpidia crusculata, and you can see the concentric rings of apothecia. So these little black dots are the apothecia from which the spores are ejected to help the boulder lichen create new boulder lichens, if they happen to land on the right boulder, that is. I took this photograph in Florida. Uh, for many years, uh, we had a home in Florida, my family, and I worked for about 20 years on a coffee table book on the Florida landscape, which came out, I think, in 2005, called The Floridas. And so I spent uh, many, many years visiting many of the natural areas um, of Florida. 
One of the places I visited was the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. This is a few miles west of Palm Beach um, in the southern section of Florida. And what we're looking at is a swamp forest. I'm standing on a boardwalk and many of the trees in that swamp forest are covered with these bright crustose lichens. It's called Christmas lichen because of the reddish color. And there's a greenish surround to the lichen as well. Um, and it's also called Baton Rouge lichen. Um, you can find it in the southeastern part of the United States, Florida, a few areas along the Gulf Coast. Baton Rouge means red stick in French. And in fact, if you look at those trees, they do indeed look like red sticks. And here's a close-up of this crustose lichen. It, you won't find the Christmas lichen in Ohio. We're too far north, at least right now. Um, but if you're in the woods and you're walking past uh, maybe a beech tree or a maple tree and you look closely at the bark, you may see an area that's fairly smooth but has these little black lines that look like somebody has tried to write with a black pen or scratch with a knife or something like that. These are the apothecia of another crustose lichen called a script lichen. Some people think that this looks like um, runes or hieroglyphics or something like that. And this is the script lichen found in um, on many trees inside woodlands in Ohio. Let's look at a few folios lichens. Um, I took this photograph in a parking area at the West Woods Nature Center, which is a beautiful nature center in Geauga County in Northeast Ohio. And I was leading a group um, that was part of an annual meeting, an organization called the Ohio Natural Areas and Preserves Association, um, a wonderful group that helps to maintain many of the 145 state nature preserves in the state of Ohio. And I don't think I've ever seen a tree, certainly in Northeast Ohio, that had more lichens growing on it than this one. This is a red maple tree but it was hard to tell it was a red maple because almost every square inch of the bark of the tree was covered with these lichens, most of which were circular. And these are called shield lichens because they sort of resemble a round, light yellow green shield. One of the questions that you may be thinking is, do the lichens harm the tree? And the answer is no, they don't because the lichens are not growing in the tree, they are resting on top of the bark. So you could actually scrape these lichens off with a knife and the tree would be almost completely unharmed. Let's look at a close-up. This is common green shield, Flavo palmelia caparata. Um, it's got a very distinctive light yellow green color, and you can see the ceridia, the reproductive ceridia in the center of the main body of the lichen, which is called the thallus. So this is the thallus. These are the lobes of the thallus. Here's another one. If we go back, if you look here, this is the, uh, the main common green shield, but right here, is another shield lichen, which is more of a blue-gray color. There's a little bit more of it up here. And let me show you a close-up of that. This is called hammered shield lichen. One of the things you notice is that the lobes are an entirely different shape. The common green shield has round lobes. These lobes tend to be long and narrow. And there are these little white speckles, which are breaks in the upper surface in the upper cortex. And if you look closely, you can see ceridia, but the ceridia are sort of around the rims and the edges of the lobes or the upper surface of the lobes. They're not clustered together in the middle of the thallus like they are on common green shield. <coughs> and so this is 
Hammered Shield lichen. It's called Hammered Shield because it looks like somebody has gone around with a little tiny ball peen hammer tapping these little concavities into the surface of the lobes. Some of my favorite lichens are found in cemeteries. Cemeteries tend to be open areas, so they get a lot of sunlight. And one of the things that lichens need to do well is lots of sunshine. Don't go deep into the woods expecting to see lots of lichens. Lichens like to be out in the sun. So here's a marble gravestone in a local cemetery, and here's a close-up on the right of one of my favorite lichens because it's such a beautiful lemon yellow or chrome yellow color. This is lemon lichen. It's a folios lichen growing on a tombstone. One of the reasons as a photographer that I enjoy lichens is sometimes I see something which to me looks like lichen fine art. This is the surface of a pink granite tombstone in a cemetery in Youngstown, Ohio. It's actually a Catholic cemetery called Calvary Cemetery. And this is a section of maybe four by eight inches completely covered with lichens. Lemon lichen is the yellow one. The dark gray one is called shadow lichen. Then the lighter, lighter green um, rosette, mealy rosette lichen, and hooded rosette lichen. So there's three or four different kinds of lichens growing together on the surface of a marble tomb, of the surface of a granite tombstone. This is a statue in a cemetery in Garrettsville in Portage County. And the statue is covered with lichens. The lichens are growing on the statue. They're not really harming the statue. Um, many cemetery superintendents don't like them and they use biocides or they scrape the lichens off. Um, and uh, the reason I'm showing this is that one of the things that's important in learning to identify lichens is the color of the lichens. And lichens can be a little bit tricky because Lichens are usually a different color when they're dry to when they're wet. So this particular lichen is a gray color in dry weather. This photograph was taken on a dry day. This photograph was taken just after a shower of rain on another day, and the lichen has turned bright green. What's happened is that when the upper cortex of a folios lichen gets wet, it becomes translucent, and when it's translucent, it allows you to see the green color of the algae, which is below the surface of the cortex. So what we're seeing here is the algal part of the lichen, green, because we're looking at it through the top surface, which has become almost transparent because we've had a shower of rain. So be careful. Um, when you see a lichen and you say, oh, it's a green lichen, and you look it up in the book and you can't find any green lichens, it's probably a gray lichen that you happen to have seen when it was damp. I had a, a trip a few years ago to a beautiful area that's beloved by botanists, the Bruce Peninsula north of Toronto, Canada. Uh, the Bruce Peninsula, about 100 miles long uh, north to south, and it juts out into Georgian Bay, Lake Huron. And on the boat trip, we passed a number of islands where some of the rocks were covered with this spectacular orange lichen. Well, unfortunately, I couldn't photograph it other than this shot from the boat because the lichen um, was privately owned. You weren't allowed to land on this one. But later on during my trip, I was driving around uh, some cattle farming areas and in the center of some of the fields were piles of rocks like this. And on the rocks were these same beautiful orange lichens. These particular lichens are called elegant sunburst lichen and they love to grow on rocks that birds poop on. Bird poop is full of nitrogen compounds, 
And to me, um, that's not something that I would find attractive, but the elegant sunburst lichens absolutely love to grow on rocks that have received a large hunk of bird poop from time to time. And so all I had to do was park my car, walk into the field and take some close up photographs of this beautiful, elegant sunburst lichen. So you can see the lobes are very narrow and you can see that this has apothecia, no ceridia, no ceridia, no isidia. Um, the elegant sunburst lichen reproduces through apothecia. Here's another type of sunburst lichen. Uh, this one is the maritime sunburst lichen, and here's a close-up. It's not actually commonly found in Ohio, but it often comes in on nursery trees that are purchased by botanical gardens. This one was growing on a, a maple tree that had been purchased from a nursery in Portland, Oregon, where the maritime sunburst lichen grows quite frequently. So now it's also living in Ohio. This is a very famous lichen. This is lung lichen. It used to grow in Ohio. It's been recorded from 15 or so counties in Ohio, but it hasn't been seen for decades because lung lichen only likes to grow in old growth, humid forests, original old growth forests. It needs old growth timber it really won't grow anywhere else. So I had to go all the way to the Black River in the upper peninsula of Michigan to find the conditions that would allow the lung lichen to grow. This is dog lichen. It's called dog lichen because uh, it's a folios lichen, but it has these apothecia which stick up and reminds some people of dog teeth, I guess. And that's why it's called dog lichen. Nature ever prone to fling some beauty round the rudest thing has clothed the avalanche of stone with moss and lichens, all her own. Poem by John Critchley Prince. So here's a boulder in the woods in Vinton County, Ohio, almost completely covered with folios lichens. These are called rock green shield lichens. This was down in Vinton County, Ohio. A little bit further south in Gallia County, which is just north of the Ohio River, in a place called Sims Creek, which is almost a paradise for lichens, there was this long section of sandstone almost completely covered with another type of folios lichen called smooth rock tripe. Rock tripe is interesting because it's one of the few lichens that people have actually tried to eat. Lichens are not pleasant to eat, like mushrooms, for example, a different kind of fungi. But Arctic explorers, when they were searching for the North Pole, when they ran out of food, some of them were tempted to eat rock tripe that was growing on rocks nearby. Having tried it, many of the Arctic explorers preferred to actually cut little pieces of leather out of their boots and boil it up because it was actually more palatable than the rock tripe. Rock tripe is very acidic. It's very indigestible, tends to give you diarrhea, and it tastes absolutely awful. May you never have to choose between eating rock tripe or your hiking boots. Let's look a little bit at, at lichens as camouflage. This is a photograph um, of a female ruby-throated hummingbird on her nest. It's a tiny little nest. It's smaller than your fist. It's not much bigger than your thumb. But the ruby-throated hummingbird, when it's built its nest, camouflages it with little pieces of shield lichens. So this is common green shield, maybe a little bit of hammered shield, little tiny fragments that it basically glues to the outside to camouflage its nest. At least one other bird does this. This is a photograph I took also in Northeast Ohio. 
of a blue-gray gnat catcher. Blue-gray gnat catcher is not much bigger than a hummingbird. And it, too, uses folios, lichen pieces, to camouflage its nest. This is the finger of Ray Showman, the retired professional lichenologist, one of the um, people who introduced me to lichens and taught me a great deal about them. And Ray's finger is pointing towards what looks like just a little piece of lichen on a tree trunk. Let's look a little bit more closely. This is not the same piece, but it's a similar piece of lichen um, that I photographed in another place. And the lichen just seems to be a little piece of lichen until we turn it over. This is what the underside of that little piece of lichen looks like. This is the lava of a green lacewing, a type of bug. And the lava is an active predator. It's one tough little lava, and it likes to eat aphids and anything else that it can catch. It has heavy-duty mandibles um, to scrunch up the aphids. The aphids are often protected by ants, but by gluing little bits of lichen to its back, the lacewing lava is able to find its way into areas of aphids and it fools the ants and gets to eat the aphids. So this is the lava of a green lacewing bug covering itself with camouflage lichen so that it can better predate on aphids. Let's look at some fruticose lichens. This one is bushy beard lichen, photographed in Southern Ohio. This one is pretty amazing. This is called Old Man's Beard, and it is the lichen with the largest, some of these filaments, are up to three feet long. I took this photograph in the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon on a trip to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's not found in Lichen. It, it's not found in Ohio, sorry. Um, the Usneas, the genus of these particular lichens, are very, very susceptible to um, the pollutants in the air, particularly from places like coal-fired power plants, they cannot handle hydrogen sulfide acid rain. Um, they need pure air, otherwise they die. Um, and that's why there were there are very, very few usneas to be found in Ohio until the Clean Air Act was passed in 1972. This one is interesting. You can see these trees are almost completely covered with beard lichens of several species. And um, the reason that I included this is that um, there is at least one bird, the northern Perula warbler, which actually makes its nest from beard lichens. Um, I've photographed the beard lichens, and I have a couple of photographs of the Perula warbler, but so far I haven't managed to actually photograph a Perula warbler on the nest. Perhaps another trip to the Upper Peninsula. Some fruticose lichens are like powder puffs. This one was photographed, the Evansii, the powder puff deer lichen, it's called, growing in the Ocala National Forest in Florida. This one's called reindeer lichen because in Arctic areas like the tundra, it is the primary food in winter of reindeer, which we would call caribou in the United States and in Canada, Cladonia rangiforina. And I photographed this in uh, Blackwater Falls State Park in West Virginia. This is what the tundra looks like. Uh, this was actually photographed in Maine um, but areas of tundra, are hundreds of square miles, the entire uh, surface of the tundra is a mixture of different types of fruticose lichen. Then we have pixie cups, another type of fruticose lichen, little tiny fairy cups. 
This was actually photographed on the stonework of Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens, a stately home in Akron, Ohio. Or this one, sinewed ramelina, which looks like a little tiny cabbage or a piece of kale or a little bit of lettuce growing on the surface of a branch. Or this one, ladder lichen, puts out these little, um, little podicia, as they're called, and out of the top of the podicia, out of the cup, grows another podicia. And out of the top of that grows another podicia. And that's why it's called ladder lichen. This one photographed in the oak openings. This is the poster child for many people, for lichens, another fruticose lichen. And what you're looking at here, the bright red apothecia. Um, this one was named after the British soldiers in the Revolutionary War, uh, wore red uniforms. And that's how the British soldier lichen gets its common name. And finally, uh, another lichen that I'm sort of proud of finding. In an old cemetery, I found this lichen that looks like gray toothpaste that's been squeezed out onto a rock. This is an old wall that was 200 years old, and it's called rock foam lichen. Henry David Thoreau enjoyed... Uh, lichens. He used to go out and study them. So what do we do if we want to learn more about lichens? The first thing I would suggest is you consider, if you're living in Ohio, you may consider joining the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association. Founded back in 2004, we have 70 plus members, about 15 student members. We hold an annual meeting, several field trips during the summer, spring, and fall. An annual newsletter membership is 10 bucks per year. It's free to students. And there's a good website, www.ohiomosslichen.org. So if you want to learn about lichens or mosses, for that matter, check out the Ohio Moss Lichen website. Um, and if you're really interested, consider joining this group. This was the very first lichen field trip that I took about 10 years ago with um, members of the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association. This is Ray Showman. Ray is one of the founding members of the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association. He's now retired, um, happily living in, in Vinton County. Uh, and here he's examining a branch of a tree. Fallen branches are a great place to look for lichens. If you want to study lichens, there are a few things you need. Make sure you've got a magnifying glass, preferably 10 to 20x, because you need to look at lichens close up. And many lichens are very small. Some of them are only the size of a fingernail. A pair of close focusing binoculars are useful so that you can look at them from a distance and also look at birds and dragonflies and things like that. A knife, if you want to take a sample of a lichen, for example, growing on a branch. Um, we, we like to use craft bags to um, take our collected lichens. And then you'll need some books or some sort of reference. Lichens prefer sunny places. So look for places that are in the sunlight if you want to find lichens. Make sure you check fallen branches along the trails. The more tree species there are, the more kinds of lichen that you'll find. You need to look very closely and you gotta carry a magnifier because many of the lichens, in order to identify them, you have to get very, very close. Old cemeteries and open picnic areas with trees and state parks are great places to find lichens. And Come along on one of the omla forays, if you wish. So how do you identify the lichen? Well, what is it growing on? Is it growing on a rock, a tree, or soil? Is it crustose? Does it look like spray paint? Does it look like a leaf? Or does it look like a little shrub or a bushy beard? How big is the thallus? What shape is it? What color is it? 
make sure you check the upper and the lower surfaces of folios lichens. Does it have any reproductive structures like apothecia, ceridia, or acidia? If you're a botanist, there are lichen keys available. You can do what I do, which is to match lichen photographs and go from there. Many lichens, particularly crustose lichens, can only be identified using chemical tests and very, very fancy equipment like thin layer chromatography by examining the spores. Lichens have over 700 different kind of special chemicals that they develop, which help them with gas exchange. They help them to discourage herbivores from eating them. They protect the lichen from sunlight and they discourage other plants from growing nearby. If you want to, you can do some chemical spot tests yourself, a K test, a C test and a P test. K test is just Drano or liquid plumber. You can buy it at your local hardware store or you can buy Clorox bleach. That's all you need to do the C test. So here's a Xanthoria lichen. You put a little drop of Clorox bleach on it and it turns bright red. Sometimes chemical tests are the only way to tell. If you want to do a lot of intensive study of lichens, you probably want to get yourself a dissecting, that's a low power microscope so that you can look at the thallus close up. If you want to look at spores, which are tiny, tiny, you'll need a compound microscope. This was actually a photograph taken through my dissecting microscope with my iPhone. You can hook up an iPhone to either binoculars or a spotting scope or the eyepiece of a microscope and use it. The first guide I would recommend you get, and I would recommend you do this even if you don't live in the state of Ohio, would be to get in touch with the Ohio Division of Wildlife, which is part of the Ohio Division of Natural Areas and Preserves, and ask them to send you a field guide, Common Lichens of Ohio Field Guide, written by Ray Showman, the professional lichenologist. It's free. You can get it for nothing. They will send you a free copy, and it's a wonderful guide to about 60 different species of lichens. It's the way I learned about lichens to start with. If you want to learn a little bit more, I'd strongly recommend you get a new book. This is a new book by another professional lichen expert. Um, he's also an expert on mosses and liverworts. He is Bob Clips, a um, emeritus professor of biology at Ohio State University. Um, this is a wonderful book put out by Ohio University Press. It's easy to read and understand. Almost a thousand of Bob's superb color photographs, and it covers 106 mosses, 30 liverworts, and 100 of the most common lichens that you can find in and around the state of Ohio. If you really want to get into lichens, ultimately you will want to acquire a copy of the Lichen Lovers Bible, Lichens of North America by Erwin Brodo with photographs by the late Sylvia Duran Shonoff and Stephen Shonoff. This is a fantastic book. This is not a field guide. It weighs nine pounds. You can weight lift with it. It's huge. Thousand pages or they're 828 pages. And it covers about 1500 of the 3600 species of lichen in North America. 900 superb color photographs. This is what a couple of pages of it looks by. If you really get into lichens, you'll want this to be in your library, but it's too heavy to put in your backpack. This is a map of Ohio, and these are the numbers of different kinds of lichens that have been found in each of the 88 counties of the state. And you can see that the fewest number of lichens are up here in the northwest corner, which is heavily farmed, not nearly as many natural areas. As we go south and east, we get into hillier country, more and more natural areas, more and more wild country and trees, 
And this is the area where you'll find the most different species of lichens. I want to introduce you to one or two people here. Um, this gentleman, Sean Pogachnik, and the gentleman here, uh, Tomas Curtis. These are both a couple of young gentlemen in their mid-20s who are doing incredible work in lichens as well as mosses. Uh, Tomas Curtis is the son of a um, naturalist with Summit County Metro Parks. He's a graduate of Kent State University. He has located and identified over 100 new lichen species and established over 300 new Ohio County records. He is a lichen prodigy. On the left, Sean Pogachnik. His father was also a, um, a botanist with Lake County Metro Park. Sean works for the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves, and he's finding many new plants, new lichens, new mosses around the Buckeye State. The gentleman in the middle, um, Jim McCormack, one of Ohio's finest naturalists and ambassadors for nature. Uh, the photograph was, was taken by Chelsea Gottfried, and Chelsea is a naturalist with Crawford County Parks, and she and Jim collaborated on Jim's latest book, which is called Gardening for Moths. And um, he does a wonderful slide program on this book and have a, has a heavy schedule of talking about moths and the important, the vital role that they play in the natural world. So these are some of the folks who are, um, you know, um, doing a great deal in terms of studying and publicizing lichens and many other aspects of Ohio nature. The one thing, the Achilles heel of lichens is they don't do a good job with air pollution. Acid rain, hydrogen sulfide from coal burning power plants before the Clean Air Act in 1972 had wiped out many of the lichens. This is the old bucket that used to scrape out the earth with a huge drag line. I think the largest drag line ever built for mining coal, strip mining coal, was Big Musky. I think it was something like twice the length of a football field. To give you an idea of the size of this hopper, you could put a small house in it or two Greyhound buses side by side. And all of the fumes from the coal burning power plants basically wiped out most of these lichens that were growing on the trees. Many of them are coming back, but they're not coming back to the same extent. These are a couple of studies done by Mr. Wetmore and another one by Ray Showman. Um, who studied uh, macro lichens. Um, they were almost completely gone in most of the industrial Ohio River Valley until the 1972 Clean Air Act. By the early 2000s, many of the lichens had come back. One of the other neat things about lichens in the 17, 1800s, they were used, especially in Northern part of Scotland. If you've ever owned a Harris Tweed jacket the Harris tweed jackets were made in the Outer Hebrides off the northwest coast of Scotland. Shetland sweaters made in the Shetland Isles off the northern coast. And the dyes that were used to dye the wool that was used to spin and weave and create these jackets and sweaters came from lichens. Crottle and Cudbear were two lichens that the that were literally scraped off the rocks. The trouble is once they had scraped the lichens off the rocks, it can take decades, if not hundreds of years for the lichens to grow back. And so they essentially put themselves out of business until synthetic dyes came along, which are what I use now to create all of these fabrics. There is a low mist in the wood. It's a good day to study lichens. Henry David Thoreau. I hope that that has given you an idea of what lichens are all about, how interesting they are, 
and a little bit of information that you can use to help to study them and learn more about them. I'm going to leave you with a poem. Both Ray Shulman, the lichenologist whom I introduced you to, um, he was one of the co-founders of the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association, and another gentleman, Don Flanagan, who unfortunately passed away about 10 years back, was also a co-founder. And both Don Flanagan and Ray Shulman also liked to write poetry about lichens. So I'm going to leave you with a lichen poem called The Lichen by Don Flanagan. And here's what he said. Hanging by a single thread, sharing tombstones with the dead, growing where no others tread, where others die, they thrive instead, the lichen. From valleys deep to mountaintops on shaded sides of rock outcrops, trees and branches bark that drops on sun-baked soil, nothing stops the lichen. Some are leaf-like, some are crusts, some are only flaky dusts, scattered around by windy gusts to places new, their life adjusts the lichen. They come in many pastel hues, black and white, greens and blues, dried by the sun, no shade to use, then watered by the morning dews, the lichen. Like king and queen, two partners royal, fungi protect and algae toil, together turning rock to soil, each to the other, always royal, the lichen. Wonderful poem, I think, and a great description of many of the aspects that are wonderful about lichens. So that's the end of my program. Thank you all for coming and listening. Um, and um, I don't know whether we have any time for questions, but um, if for sure Nay has got some, <laughs> then I'll certainly do my best. Bear in mind, I'm not a professional lichenologist, simply a, like, simply a photographer who's enjoyed finding and photographing lichens. Well, Ian, thank the you. program was very fun. And thank you so much. Your delivery and your photography um, makes you fall in love with lichen. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And there are tons of questions, many of which are repeat questions. So, um, and I noticed that you did answer a lot of these questions in your program. So I'm going to skip over the ones I think that, that you have covered um, and, and at, ask some new stuff. Um, uh oh. You mentioned the stuff about um, the presence of lichens indicates the air quality is good. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, yeah. The lichens, the one Achilles heel that they have is that many of them are susceptible to um, hydrogen sulfide. Um, mm -hmm. from coal burning power plants and some of the other emissions. Um, lichens, unfortunately, um, they are they absorb whatever is in the air. Yeah. And they have no way of getting rid of those substances that are absorbed into the body of the lichen. So they just build up. And if I it's see. hydrogen sulfide or acid rain, eventually that will kill the lichen. So even though those lichens are able to to survive just about anything else. Um, coal burning power plants have meant the death of many lichens wow. until, until the Clean Air Act came in, where now the pollutants are way, way down. And so most of these lichens, particularly things like the usnea, the beard lichens, are starting to be seen more and more, for example, in Ohio, but in much smaller numbers than they were perhaps 100 years ago. Interesting. Very interesting. So um, you mentioned that the rock tripe lichen is not very tasty, but there is a question if lichens are edible um, and are there any that are tasty? No, not that I'm aware of. And okay. only if you are truly desperate, hence the, uh, <laughs> the Arctic explorers uh, preferring to cut strips of leather off their boots rather than eat lichens because they're so distasteful, so hard to digest. Um, I have read in some books that the so-called manna from heaven that you uh -huh. read about in the Bible may in fact have been lichens. Hmm. And in Turkey, for example, there are some species of lichens that are made into bread. 
that is called manna. The, the lichens are called manna lichens, lichens in the genus Lechenora, for example. Uh -huh. So yes, um, they are occasionally mixed with other foods, but mm -hmm. I think you've got to be pretty desperate. So don't <laughs> imagine that you can go down to the supermarket and buy um, boletes and beautiful mushroom equivalents of lichens. Lichens are not really to be eaten. Um, okay. They are eaten. They are eaten by animals. Okay, Reindeer, but, but they're not. Animals. They're not poisonous, though, right? They're, Ian, they're, they're, not, they're not poisonous. No. Okay. They're okay. Not poisonous, but it's okay. really only animals that are mm -hmm. tough enough to deal with them from a digestive point of view. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about the host. Um, for the lichens, and they prefer different species of trees. Are any specialized to only like one species of tree? Well, there are certainly some types of lichen. Um, definitely the folios lichens, most of them tend to prefer um, specific types of trees. Um, some okay. lichens like acidic trees. Um, some lichens like trees that are um, more basic, if you will, in terms of the um, the type of wood. Um, and um, some some lichens, for example, only grow on pine trees, which are full of that very acidic resin. Um, like Imshogia is one genus that tends to grow um, on pine trees. Um, so yeah, um, most, uh, most lichens will have a preference for either one particular type of tree or perhaps groups of trees um, deciduous trees, perhaps, rather than coniferous trees. Now, do they harm the tree or do they break down the, the rocks when they attach to them? Two parts to that. Uh, no, they don't harm the trees. Um, they, as I say, they don't tend, they, lichens don't have roots. They have just little attachments that are called rhizines, or some of them have a single attachment called a hapter. And that's simply used to attach them to the surface of the bark. So you can actually remove a folios lichen um, and without really harming the tree. On the other hand, yes, some of the crustose lichens that grow on rocks, the hyphae, uh, the filaments, if you will, the lower part of the crust can actually penetrate the rock up to 10 to 15 millimeters into the rock. And over an enormous period of time, those crustose lichens actually help to break down the surface of the rock and start the process of generating soil from rock. But it takes forever for that to happen. So it's a very, very slow process. Okay, great. Um, here's a question. You you showed that picture of the beard lichen, and um, they're curious if that is the same as Spanish moss. No, Spanish moss is not a lichen. Spanish moss okay. is actually an epiphyte. It's an air plant that actually grows on trees, which again, it only uses the tree for support. The epiphyte, if you will, which means air plant, the Spanish moss doesn't actually have roots it doesn't take root in the branches. It simply hangs from the branches like a lichen, but it isn't a lichen. Spanish moss is in fact a plant. Uh, it's not a lichen. So it has a different morphology. Mm -hmm. um, but the Perula warbler, for example, uh, the Perula warbler nests and builds its nest in the Southern United States from Spanish moss. And in the northern areas, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and the northern Great Lakes, it prefers to use usnea, the old man's beard, because okay. Spanish moss doesn't grow that far north. If you look at a map for nesting Perula warblers, you'll see the area around the Great Lakes, the industrialized cities, where there are really no lichens anymore or no usnea lichens, because of the pollutants from coal-fired power plants and industry, there's a gap where perula warblers typically don't nest around those areas because there's neither Spanish moss, we're too far north, or there's usnea, which isn't there because of the pollution from the power plants. So bit by bit, usneas are starting to reappear um, in the once industrialized areas around the Great Lakes. Um, but 
um, they're they're not coming back in the numbers that the um, I think that the Perola warbler would like to see to have enough to build a nest with. I see. Um, Ian, do you know if there are any endangered lichens out there? Very any much. Any of so. them listed? Yes, there are some listed endangered lichens. Very much so. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it's good to know that people are paying attention to them, right? <laughs> Indeed, they are. <laughs> you mentioned the reindeer. Can you tell us what other animals eat lichens? Well, reindeer for sure. Um, mm -hmm. The um, you know the reindeer that um, that we would call them caribou. Okay. Um, there's a wonderful um, nature program about the migration of the caribou from the um, from the northern slopes near Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. Um, they go into the Brooks Range. Um, and then they go back down to uh, the Arctic Ocean. Um, and they very much rely upon um, lichens um, mm -hmm. during the winter months, okay? Yeah. Uh, and um, it's the same uh, with the reindeer, which is essentially the same as caribou um, in Asia. Uh, moose, which of course we get in Maine and other Northern states, uh, moose eat lichens as well. Okay. And I believe there are some rodents and maybe even things like flying squirrels that may chomp on a little bit of lichen from time to time. Insects also um, use lichens. Um, and there are a lot of tiny insects that make their homes in lichens. And so a lot of birds will like to land on tree trunks or branches that are full of lichens and then wander around warblers, for example, um, will like to wander around where there are lichens because they'll find little tiny organisms and insects, uh, little tiny caterpillars, perhaps, um, wandering around amongst the lichens. Interesting. Um, I know you've read a lot about lichens, Ian. So in your readings, have you ever come across anything um, talking about how indigenous people may have used lichens? Well, um not that I can think of. Okay. Not, not not that I can think of. I mean, I'm I'm sure they have. I'm sure mm -hmm. that lichens um, were probably used as food, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, How about medicinal it's possible that uses? Lichens, it's possible that lichens have been used a, a little bit like sphagnum moss, perhaps as dressings on wounds. Interesting. I know that okay. sphagnum moss has been used by the American Indians to dress wounds and staunch mm -hmm. blood, for example. And it's possible that some of the lichens may have been used for the same thing. But I don't recall reading anything about their use okay. by indigenous peoples. Excellent. Well, I think we've come to the end here, Ian. Thank you so much for um, a delightful program this evening. The the chat is blowing up with love for lichens the day before Valentine's Day. So um, I appreciate you giving this program tonight and I wish everyone a good evening. Wonderful. And remember, lichens can be seen every day of the year unless they're covered with snow. Mushrooms go away in a couple of days, but the lichens are with us forever. Excellent. Thanks so much, Ian. Sure thing. Good night. <laughs> Good night, everybody.